It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, James Franson, professor of physics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Before coming to UMBC, Jim was professor of electrical and computer engineering at Johns Hopkins University and principal staff member at the Applied Physics Laboratory. His research is on entanglement and quantum information and on quantum mechanics in the space-time manifold described by general relativity. His group was the first to demonstrate quantum cryptography in optical fibers and the first quantum logic operations using photons as qubits. He earned his BS in physics from Purdue and his PhD from Caltech. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Optical Society of America. The title of his talk tonight is Entanglement, <coughs> Einstein's Spooky Action at a Distance. Please join me in welcoming Jim to the podium. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me here uh, tonight. Um, as most of you probably know, Einstein did not have a very high opinion of the quantum theory, and so I've shown a picture of Einstein off in this corner, and a picture of one of our recent experiments off in that corner. And this is meant to illustrate the fact that there, there is a conflict between Einstein's ideas and um, modern experiments. Now, Einstein had a series of uh, debates and discussions uh, with Niels Bohr uh, regarding the, uh, the meaning of quantum mechanics. And I was able to uh, find a photograph, an old photograph, of Einstein during one of these discussions. And <laughs> as you can see, Einstein took this very seriously. And uh, so this entire talk is very serious. All right. So what is this spooky action at a distance that Einstein uh, really did not care for very much. And the point is that in quantum mechanics, we can create situations where two distant objects or two distant systems, as we call them, are uh, linked together in such a way that if we uh, disturb one system at one location, we will instantly disturb the other system, even though it's far away. And uh, an example of that is shown here. Um, an electron is meant to be orbiting around the outside of an atom. And far away, a second uh, electron is orbiting around another atom. And according to quantum mechanics, if we measure the properties of this atom over here, it can instantly change the properties of that atom over there. And that seems very much in contradiction to the ideas of special relativity. And Einstein objected to this and referred to it in a derogatory way as a spooky action at a distance. Now. Recent experiments have indeed verified these effects, and so that's one of the main topics of my talk. And not only have they been verified, but these strange effects even have practical applications. And so as time permits, I will talk about what some of those might be. Now, what I thought I'd do is begin with a, a sort of a introduction to quantum mechanics for those of you that might not be familiar with it. And uh, then I'll go on to the idea of entanglement itself, which is really a kind of a correlation which is stronger than any classical correlation uh, could be. Now, historically, in uh, 1935, Einstein and his colleagues, Podolsky and Rosen, wrote a very influential paper in which they uh, disputed the interpretation of quantum mechanics and said that there really should be some other more accurate theory that describes these things. Uh, without randomness, and they referred to those as hidden variable theories. So we'll talk about that a bit. <clears throat> now, for almost 30 years, Einstein's objections were considered to be just a matter of interpretation or even philosophy. But uh, in 1964, John Bell uh, proved an inequality which showed that actually any theory of the kind that Einstein believed in, these hidden variable theories, actually disagreed with quantum mechanics in a way that could be measured. And so at that point, this became an experimental uh, subject. And uh, I'll talk about the experiments that have been done, some of them uh, 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 recently and some before that. And then I'll also talk a bit about some of the applications, um, quantum cryptography and quantum computers. Now, when I get to this part of the talk, it will become a bit more technical uh, for those uh, physicists who might be in the audience. Uh, but if you're lucky, we'll run out of time before we get to the technical parts, and you won't have to listen to that. 
There are some pictures anyway, if nothing else. All right, now some of the uh, basic properties of quantum mechanics that make it very different from uh, classical physics. And um, where does it get its name? Quantum mechanics. And uh, the word quantum refers to the fact that physical quantities, such as energy and momentum, uh, occur in discrete amounts. Uh, in classical physics, a, a beam of light could contain arbitrary, continuously varying amount of energy. For example, we could take a light bulb and vary the amount of current through it and produce an arbitrary of the light bulb. But according to quantum mechanics, the energy in a beam of light uh, only uh, occurs in certain uh, discrete amounts. Um, and the energy in the beam of light would be given, the energy E is equal to some integer n times a constant, uh, which is called Planck's constant, and then the frequency of the light, which is designated here as the Greek letter nu. So I apologize, there will be a few Greek letters and a few equations, uh, but that's, that's the way it is in quantum mechanics. So anyway, the, uh, the number of, um, number of uh, the energy in a beam of light is quantized in these units, and somewhat ironically, Einstein played a major role here in the development of mechanics in that he was the one to interpret this formula as meaning that light consists of tiny particles known as photons. So he did play a role in the development of quantum mechanics, even though he basically didn't agree with most of it. Now, the energy in a photon is very small, and so as a result, this laser pointer is uh, producing on the order of 10 to the 18th photons per second. That's a billion times a billion every second. And so the individual photons must be very weak, as you can see. But nevertheless, we have instruments that can detect photons with a relatively high probability, uh, one at a time. So we do have that capability. All right, so quantum mechanics is quantized and things occur in uh, discrete amounts. Another very uh, important and basic property of quantum mechanics is that it says that certain things occur at random, and even in principle, uh, these things cannot be predicted in advance. And Einstein uh, did not agree with that either, and he made the famous statement that God does not play dice with the universe. Uh, so a simple example of this would be, take one of our particle, particles of light, a, a single photon, and send it into a half-silvered mirror so that uh, in classical physics, uh, half the light would go this way and half would go that way. But the photon is not split apart, and so the photon must go either this way or that way. And according to quantum mechanics, that's a totally random occurrence. We cannot predict, even in principle, whether it goes this way or that way. And Einstein uh, did not agree with that. So Einstein felt that there should be a better theory or a more detailed theory which would predict these things. And uh, maybe we don't know what the theory is, but surely there is such a theory. So in his idea, uh, um, when a photon comes on into a situation like this, one of these half-silvered mirrors, there would be some kind of information carried along with each photon that would determine whether that photon would go this way or whether it would go that way. And so things would be totally predictable. And this kind of theory is what's known as a hidden variable uh, theory. And we'll consider these kinds of theories in more detail a little bit later. So basically, Einstein did not believe in the randomness, and he felt, well, there's no proof it's random. Maybe there's some theory that could explain it. Now, another important feature of uh, quantum mechanics has to do with the role of particles and waves. In classical physics, particles and waves are very different things. It's of water, and they're moving outwards from here. And here's a picture of some particles of sand, and clearly these are very different, right? Now, wave motion on water really is an oscillation, and what happens is that the water at one particular point bobs up and down. But the peaks move along at a certain velocity, and so it appears that the waves are traveling along, but what's really happening is that the waves are bobbing up and down. All right. So one of the important uh, features or uh, properties that waves have is that they can produce interference effects. One wave can interfere with another. And what does that mean? Well, if two waves intersect each other, they can either add to become stronger, or they can, in fact, cancel out to eliminate each other. And that's illustrated in this picture where we, uh, something dropped in the water here to start some wave traveling outward. 
and something dropped here to start waves traveling outwards. And you can see that where the waves intersect, there is some kind of intersection, interaction. So what happens is if the peak of one wave lines up with the peak of another wave, that makes a wave twice as strong, and we call that constructive interference, and we say that the two, two waves are in phase. But if the uh, peak of one wave corresponds to the minimum of another wave, then the two actually cancel out, and so you would get no wave at all, and we call that out of phase, and uh, th this kind of process is referred to as interference. Now, in general, we can vary the position of one wave compared to the other, and that's called varying the phase of the wave. And that's an important uh, feature in the experiments that I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, quantum mechanics says a rather, um, well, I'll first let's get into the interference of two beams of light. Uh, this, uh, this experiment shows that we have uh, light, uh, which is a wave classically traveling along in this direction. It goes through a slit or a pinhole, so it then diverges out into a spherically uh, growing wave, and the lines here are meant to represent the peaks in the wave. Uh, then it goes through two more slits or two more pinholes and makes two more wave fronts. And where they cross, we get this interference. So if the waves are in phase, we get a strong uh, light signal there. And if the two waves are out of phase, we get no light at all. <coughs> so we do get interference effects. And, the, and a picture of that from the laboratory is shown here, uh, where light from two sources is either uh, interfering to make it stronger or um, uh, to make it weaker, depending on their relative phase. Now we come to quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics makes a rather strange assertion, which is that there is no difference, really, between particles and waves, and that all particles are actually described by waves. And at first, that may seem very strange, considering the difference between a, a particle of sand and uh, waves on the ocean, but this is what quantum mechanics says. So in fact, in quantum mechanics, all particles are described by a so-called wave function, uh, that's just a terminology, and it's conventionally written in terms of the Greek letter psi for no good reason, but just historically. And what this means is that the uh, height or amplitude of the wave uh, depends on the position x. And the interpretation of this wave is that the probability to find the particle at some particular location x uh, depends on the magnitude or absolute value of the wave and the square of that. So indeed, if you send a beam of atoms uh, through a slit like this, they'll behave like waves, and uh, they'll propagate out and produce an interference pattern just like um, classical waves would do. And this is commonly observed. Uh, an example of this is um, uh, an experiment that we did when we were at Johns Hopkins. And what we did was we took a beam of helium atoms and bounced them off the surface of a crystal. And the crystal has a regular pattern on the surface, and that acts uh, similar to a diffraction gradient in optics, so that some of the atoms are, come off at a very well-defined angle, which is equivalent to uh, being reflected by a mirror, and other uh, atoms come off at different angles, uh, which are produced by this diffraction effect, and so this shows that, indeed, the atoms do behave like waves. So this is called wave-particle duality, and in quantum mechanics, there really is no difference between one or another, what we think of as waves are really particles, and particles are really waves. Now, in quantum mechanics, uh, we have what are known as superposition states, and what these correspond to are two situations that are incompatible with each other, but the claim is that these two circumstances exist simultaneously. <clears throat> an example of that would be, once again, a single photon coming into a half-silvered mirror or a beam splitter. And the photon might go off this way, and we'll refer to that as the state or condition A, being the photon being in path A. Or if the photon went this way, we'll refer to that as being in the state B. And in quantum mechanics, uh, we write an equation which says that the actual state of the system is the one possibility plus the other, but the interpretation is that both of these circumstances really exist at the same time. And uh, that seems maybe a little counterintuitive. The photon is a particle. How could it be here and there both? And how could we possibly show that it's in both places at the same time? 
So how we, can, how we can show that is to consider our photon coming in, and perhaps it goes this way and perhaps it goes that way. But suppose we add a mirror on each path, as shown here, so that this light or photon is reflected back again, and this photon is reflected back again. And given that the photon is described by a wave, then the light that comes through here from this path, or that comes here and gets reflected from that path, either add up and give constructive interference or they will cancel out and give destructive interference depending on uh, the distance from here to here versus the, the distance from there to there. We can control the relative phase by adjusting uh, the position of those mirrors. And so when we do it, what we find is that the probability that a photon will come out here um, <clears throat> will depend on the difference in path lengths. And in fact, if you vary the path length or the phase, we'll find an oscillatory uh, behavior of that. So the point is then, if the photon really went on one path only at a time, how could it measure the position of both mirrors simultaneously? So clearly something really does go along both paths simultaneously. It is a single particle and it is described by a wave which actually does travel along both of these paths simultaneously. Um, another situation of uh, superposition states is the so-called schrodinger cat uh, paradox. And Schrodinger considered a situation where we have a radioactive atom that emits uh, decay particles such as an alpha particle. And uh, during the time that this is happening, there will be some probability amplitude that the particle was emitted and some probability that it's not been emitted yet. And in quantum mechanics, that would be described by one of these superposition states where we claim that both possibilities exist simultaneously. And so then Schrodinger thought, well, what if we have a detector that can detect this particle, and if it detects it, it sets off some mechanism uh, releasing some poison which kills the cat in the box. And if it doesn't detect it, uh, the cat is alive. And Schrodinger argued that since we have both of these possibilities existing at the same time, one of these superposition states, then we should have a state of the cat in which it is neither alive or dead, but both at the same time. Now, Schrodinger thought that paradox because how could we possibly have a cat that's both alive and dead at the same time? And the answer is that in principle, we could create such a system that as a function of time, gradually it would become one or the other as it interacts with the environment. So if, if there's time, what I'll talk about is our current experiments we are attempting to uh, create short cats that are entangled do some interference between each other. So that's the nature of our current research. Now this topic has gotten a lot of attention in the popular press, as you might imagine, and so people have come up with various depictions of what the Schrodinger cat actually looks like. Uh, I like the one on the top because the mechanism that kills is menacing. And in this one, as a zombie because it's both alive and dead at the same time. And in that case, it might be wise to uh, don't let the cat out of the box until you're ready to do the experiment. So anyway, it's a popular subject. Well, with that bit of introduction, we come to the main um, subject, which is entanglement. And um, so what is entanglement? Well, Schrodinger considered a situation where we have two distant objects or two distant systems and uh, they are in a superposition state of the kind that's shown here. <clears throat> so suppose we have photon one that could go on a beam splitter and go off into path A or path B, and photon two, which may be miles away, can go into path one or path two. And what we do in our lab is we can create states of these two photons that are entangled in the sense that the total state is shown here. Either both uh, photons are in path one, this one here and this one here, or both are in this path, this one here and this one here. And the claim is that both of these possibilities really exist at the same time. And I'll show some evidence to prove that they really do exist at the same time. So that's the idea, two distant objects uh, which are in essence correlated. They're both in the path A, or they're both in the path B, but the correlation turns out to be much stronger than anything that could be done classically. So just to uh, show this a little more uh, <clears throat> in a little more detail. The idea is that both photons went this way, 
or both photons went that way. And the plus sign indicates that both of these possibilities really do exist in reality at the same time. And uh, we can prove that experimentally. So this is entanglement. Th th this state is entangled. Uh, it's a strong degree of correlation. Now, what happens if we measure the state of one of these photons? Suppose we put a detector in here, one of the detectors I mentioned that can actually detect a single photon. And in this state here, where we have AA plus BB, put it over here and find that that photon is in path A. Then that means that the second photon must also be in path A. Or if we measure this one and find that it's in path B, then we can immediately conclude that the other one must be in path B. So what quantum mechanics says is that when we do a measurement like this on an entangled system, we measure this one, and it instantly changes the situation of the distant particle. Uh, why is that? Well, the claim is that this photon was originally in both of these paths simultaneously. We measure over here, and then this changes instantly. And so, indeed, at least the mathematical description does change instantly. The question is whether this has real physical effects or not, or whether it's just a correlation. And the answer will be that it has real physical effects that we can measure. And so measuring something here really does instantly change something far away, even if it's miles apart. Now, how do we know that both of these states uh, really exist? in such an entangled state? How do we know that the photon is, these photons really are in both of these incompatible uh, options at the same time? So if you recall, when we had just a single photon and we sent it into a beam split, we could show that it really went along both paths simultaneously by putting mirrors in here and essentially measuring the position of those mirrors so the photon had to go both ways. And so the idea that I had a number of years ago was that we could prove the same thing for entangled states where we have two photons that are very far apart by using quantum interference between these photons even though they are far apart. So uh, here is an equation which I apologize for but for the experts in the audience anyway. Uh, the entangled state of energy here is one in which uh, we emit these two photons at the same time from some common source so one goes this way and one goes that way. They're emitted at exactly the same time, but that time is totally uncertain. And furthermore, we have a superposition of all possible such times, which is an entangled state. So mathematical sum or integral over all possible times, <clears throat> this mathematical object here uh, creates a photon at that time in path two, and this one creates a photon in path one at that time. So this is the mathematical form create photons at the same time, all those times uh, essentially exist simultaneously. And so I have the idea that we would take these kinds of photons and send them off into two distant uh, apparatus that measure them. And the way that I thought we should measure them is to put beam splitters in here. I'm not sure if you can see these beam splitters, such that the photon that goes here might go along this path, or it could go transmitted through the beam splitter and go along this path. And then there's a second beam splitter that recombines them so that the photon could come out this way or that way, and there will be a contribution from both paths in the probability that it comes out either way. Now, a device like this uh, allows you to get interference between the wave traveling along the two arms, and it's called an interferometer. And uh, what I predicted, and it was very controversial at the time, was that, in fact, uh, this photon and this photon, in some sense, really are linked together and interact with each other and must do so in order to produce the predicted uh, results. So just to say a little bit more about that, what I showed was that <coughs> this, this photon can come out here or it can come out there. And in classical physics, one would assume that whether it comes out here or there must be determined only by the setting of this measuring device here, this phase setting here, and it couldn't possibly depend on the setting of that phase setting over there, which may be miles away. But the prediction was that indeed, whether it comes out here or here depends not, the, not only on this setting, but also on that setting. And what I also 
showed was that any classical interpretation of this would require information to be transmitted faster than the speed of light from the one photon to the other. So roughly speaking, any classical interpretation of this would require that this photon decide what it's going to do and instantly tell the other one so it can do the same thing. And uh, that, of course, uh, as you might suspect, was controversial. So let me explain a little bit about how this effect um, actually works. How do we get this interference? And the idea is, that once again, the photons are emitted at exactly the same time. And we only accept uh, events or outcomes where both photons arrive at the same time. So that means they must have traveled the same distance. And therefore, uh, both photons must have taken the longer paths, long and long, or they must have both taken the short paths, which we rec um, represent as short, short. And in quantum mechanics, what we get is uh, a superposition of these two possibilities, these probability amplitudes, and we put those together and square it to get the total probability, and uh, that gives rise to a, a dependence of the out output here that depends on the cosine squared of both uh, added together. Now, this violates what's known as the Bell's inequality that I'll talk about in, in just a bit. <clears throat> but roughly speaking, it does show that classically, uh, you could not get the uh, predicted results unless information is transmitted instantaneously between the two locations. Uh, this was controversial, and for a number of reasons. I have a, a letter from the leading expert in quantum optics at the time who said that this was impossible. And there are a couple reasons why. Uh, one is that common sense would say that whatever happens here could have nothing to do with how you set this device over here. And furthermore, in, in quantum optics, there's something known as the coherence length. And if the difference of these paths is bigger than this so-called coherence length, then classically there would be no interference at all, whereas I was claiming that there should be interference. So fortunately for me at least, uh, all this turned out to be true and uh, has been demonstrated in many cases. And now this device is widely used for uh, practical applications such as sending secret messages using quantum cryptography. Now there are other forms of entanglement that I'm not going to talk about tonight. Um, don't have time to talk about too many different ways of doing it. But one could have entanglement in the polarizations of two photons. There's a wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And the direction that the electric field points in is called the polarization. So a photon can be polarized in the x direction or in the y direction. And we can create entangled states where both photons are polarized in one direction or they're both polarized in the other direction and you can violate this Bell's inequality using that kind of um, system. Uh, we can have entanglement between the paths that the photons take. Uh, we can have entanglement in time and energy, which is the basis for the interferometer that I just mentioned. Uh, we can have entanglement of uh, atoms or ions or superconductors and many different things. So it's not just um, photons that can be entangled. In fact, we can have entanglement between many different properties all at once, and called hyper-entanglement. All right, so now let's go back in time <coughs> to 1935 when Einstein uh, and his colleagues objected to these ideas. And uh, their objection was on the following example, where we have some particle that decays into two particles. And be, from conservation of momentum, they have to come off in the same direction. So if particle one goes this way along the blue arrow, Particle two has to go the other way, exactly. <clears throat> and if this particle went that way, then the other one had to go in the opposite direction. So this is another example of an entangled state. And uh, what Stein basically asked is, well, these are clearly correlated, but how is this different than a classical correlation? So what they argued had to do with what they referred to as an element of reality. This is starting to sound... Uh, somewhat philosophical indeed, right? Here's reality. All right, so they, what they said was that if in any way, without disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty uh, what its value is, then we will refer to that property as an element of reality. So in this example, if we can predict uh, whether the particle will come out here or there, surely that's something that uh, is a, a part of reality. And then they further argued 
any complete theory should be able to predict um, or explain all of the elements of reality. So in this example, uh, we can predict whether this particle will come out here or here by measuring where this particle came out. Uh, Einstein assumed that that could not disturb the distant particle. And so, in essence, he felt that, well, this must be determined long. It's an element of reality. Quantum mechanics should explain this. And quantum mechanics is therefore an incomplete theory. So this is a very logical argument. It makes perfectly good sense. Uh, but in any way, um, this was his criticism of quantum mechanics. So instead, what Einstein advocated is what's known as the hidden variable theory, which I mentioned uh, briefly before, the idea that each particle would carry some information along with it, some set of information. Uh, based on that information, particles would then decide or you know, determine what measurements would occur. And so nothing would happen at random. And instead, everything was determined by these so-called hidden variables. Now, hidden variable theories assume two general properties. One is the idea of realism, which says that nature must have certain properties that exist whether we measure it or not, right? It seems perfectly reasonable. And Einstein's example was, well, does the moon really exist if no one is looking at it? The answer to Einstein, at least, well, obviously, right? The moon exists whether anybody's looking at it. But according to quantum mechanics, that's not strictly true. And in general, realism is not a property of nature. Uh, the other assumption that these theories often make is locality, which is the idea that what we do to one thing cannot instantly affect something far away, as you might suspect from relativity theory. And if you combine both of these properties, then we have what's known as a local realistic theory. And this is what Einstein uh, advocated. So as I said, uh, people thought for almost 30 years that this was almost a philosophical objection or a matter of interpretation. Uh, people didn't pay to it. He didn't claim that quantum mechanics gave them wrong results, just that it wasn't co a complete theory. So John Bell, though, then in 1964, proved that actually quantum mechanics disagrees with any such theory. So what Bell did was he considered the most general rel re local realistic theory of this kind and considered what it would predict for experiments. Uh, where we have entanglement. And to use the example of the interferometer that I mentioned earlier, uh, John Bell suggested that we should make measurements where the phase or the length of these paths uh, could be one of three values, phi A, phi B, and phi C. And then Bell proved the following inequality or equation. And what he said was, let the, consider the probability that this particle comes out in the horizontal direction, and also this one comes out in that direction. We'll call it probability P. And we'll say we'll measure that probability when the phase setting on the left is phi sub A and the phase setting on the right is phi sub B. So this is the probability that this will come out here, and this will come out here for those two phase settings. And then he says, let's subtract the probability, the same probability, if this one is set to phase A, but this one is set to phase C. And then we take the absolute value or the magnitude. And he showed that for any local realistic theory of the kind that Einstein advocated, that must be less than or equal to 1 plus the probability of this happening if this is phase B and this is phase C. So somewhat not intuitive equation, but he proved that this was true. And the important point is that quantum mechanics violates this, and the experiments done with these kinds of interferometers violate this. And so what it really shows is that there is no explanation for these random things. There is no classical of correlations that would describe what happens. And roughly speaking, any classical theory would have to not depend on information carried along with the particles, but instead the particles must communicate uh, with each other. So this is the... Uh, Bell's theorem, which played a very important role in the development of this field, because now people could do experiments to see what actually did happen. The people I've spoken to who actually did the first experiments will all admit that the only reason they did the experiments was because they thought perhaps this is just strange enough, that maybe quantum mechanics is not right, otherwise why bother to spend five years to do an experiment? All right, so then we'll go on to a brief discussion of... Um, the experiments, and 
basically what they do is they show that that uh, there is no classical explanation for this and uh, in particular what quantum mechanics predicts is different from what Einstein had hoped. Uh, not only did this generate interest in quantum mechanics and these kinds of entanglement, but it also led to technology that can now be used for various practical uh, uses. <clears throat> the first such experiment was done at Harvard in 1973. Uh, Holt was a graduate student, and Pipkin was his professor. And unfortunately for uh, Mr. Holt, uh, the experiment disagreed with quantum mechanics and agreed with class. So you might ask what happens in that case. And the answer is they did not publish this result. Okay. Now you may find that amusing, but when you think about it, people do experiments. They're supposed to find out what's true and what isn't, right? And so there's a little bias here. The experiments that uh, disagreed with quantum mechanics don't get published. And the ones that do agree, they do get published. And Richard Feynman used to complain about this sort of thing, that there was a bias in the way science is done. Anyway, uh, Holt did get his PhD anyway, and he, he graduated. <coughs> uh, then Ed Fry at the University of Texas, a few years later, did the experiment. It agreed with quantum mechanics, but the uh, statistics were very significant and decided the issue. So it wasn't until some years later that John Clauser at Berkeley did the first experiment, uh, which really did show a convincing violation of the Bell's inequality. It showed that Einstein's views of this were incorrect, and so on. <clears throat> now, back in these days, anyone who questioned the idea that quantum mechanics might be wrong or that we should test it was sort of viewed as a crackpot. And Clauser uh, got his PhD, but he never succeeded in academia, never became a professor, and his career was ruined. Then in 1981, uh, Alan Aspey's group did uh, a more complete experiment and what they did was an experiment where the uh, measuring devices were far enough apart and the measurements were so fast that light could not travel from here to there in time for information to travel at the speed of light and provide some sort of alternative explanation. Um, these first experiments were all done with atoms, uh, one atom at a time, illuminated with a laser. And they were very difficult experiments because not many photons would come out and it was a complicated apparatus. <coughs> The Maryland showed that you could generate these entangled photons instead by sending a laser through a crystal, a nonlinear crystal, and that would generate lots and lots of entangled photons. And so that allowed uh, uh, experiments to be done much more easily with better counting rates and higher um, statistics. So those are some of the early experiments. Uh, some of the later experiments are shown here. Uh, there's a group in Switzerland who used the uh, non-local interferometer that I mentioned earlier uh, to do an experiment of this kind where the separation between the two photons that were measured was 10 kilometers. And this also violated Bell's inequality and showed that, that uh, quantum mechanics is right and Einstein essentially was wrong. So here's a diagram of the experiment. The two photons were generated in an entangled state in Geneva. They traveled in opposite directions through optical fiber, the same kind that, that you have in your neighborhood that bring uh, in your uh, television stations. <clears throat> and then they, one went to uh, the western side of uh, Switzerland and the, one, the other one went to the eastern side of Switzerland. And uh, what they showed was that any classical interpretation of this would require that the signals would have to travel greater than 10,000 times faster than the speed of light. So that was a very convincing uh, demonstration that that quantum mechanics was right and entanglement was the real thing. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about some of the applications of this, and I'll have to admit that I was very surprised when I proposed this interferometer. I thought this was pure science and interesting, but of no use whatsoever. Uh, but it turns out that these things do have applications. So let's say talk a little bit about cryptography and the need for better cryptography, actually. When you uh, use the secure communication on your computer to um, put your credit card number in and send it to Amazon.com, that makes use of something called the public key encryption system. And the security of that system is based on the following fact, or perhaps assumption, <laughs> which is that if you have two large numbers, N1 and N2, two integers, it's very easy to multiply them together 
and get a much larger number n. So pr multiplying numbers is easy. It turns out doing the reverse process of factoring, that if you're given the big number n and you want to find the two factors n1 and n2, that is very difficult on a computer. And for about 400 digits in this number, it would take longer than the age of the this on a supercomputer. So it's very difficult. And so the security of these systems is based on the fact that uh, the person who's supposed to receive the information knows what these factors are and nobody else can figure it out. Uh, well, that's great right now, but the problem is that quantum computers, so-called quantum computers, can solve this problem or could solve this problem very quickly. And this of, uh, secure communication systems would no longer be secure and people could read all of your credit card numbers and so on. Assuming they don't already, uh, but anyhow. <laughs> So one way to avoid this, uh, in fact, there's a quantum mechanical solution to this problem known as quantum cryptography. And uh, one way of doing this is shown here. Here we have these two uh, interferometers, and they're meant to be very far apart. This was taken out of science, where they're shown close together, Science Magazine. But these two things are very far apart. <coughs> and the idea is that if this phase setting is the same as that, then these two uh, photons are correlated over a distance. So if this one comes out here, we'll call that a zero bit. And if it comes out there, over here also, we'll call that a bit zero. If this one comes out here, we'll call that a bit one and also a bit one. So if we repeat this process for many, many photons, we can set up a series of bits in these two distant locations that are exactly the same. And that is, in fact, uh, a secret code. That's the idea of a secret code. And in the old days, Couriers would carry this, these in a briefcase from one place to another, although sometimes they were intercepted or given away. So the idea then is that we could set up a secret code this way, and then we could encrypt messages at one place, uh, send the encrypted messages over, and then decrypt it with the secret code at the other location. And I think one of the interesting things about this is that there's literally no information at all carried in these photons as they're traveling because they haven't even decided what they're going to do until they reach this distant point where they then are measured and decide what to do. So there's no way that an eavesdropper can get this information. And so quantum, quantum uh, cryptography may be a way to provide secure communications, uh, even if quantum computers make public key systems not secure in the future. Another possible application that I briefly mentioned already is quantum computing. And uh, as I said, so-called quantum computers are expected to be able to solve a number of problems very efficiently in problems that would take, uh, are essentially impossible on a classical computer. They would just take an exponentially large amount of time. Now, one of the features of these quantum computers is that all of the bits in the computer are in quantum bits, such as a photon. And uh, they may represent the, bit, the uh, value bit zero, or they may represent the value one. And in a conventional computer, of course, the, the digits are uh, all binary, zeros and ones. But in a classical computer, the, uh, the bits have definite values. You wouldn't want to scramble them up. Now, in a quantum computer, we deliberately put them into entangled states, or superposition states at least, uh, so that we have a probability of zero and an equal probability of one with some uh, arbitrary phase factor in front. So the values of the bits are not determined at all. And you might think this would be a big disadvantage to have all the bits scrambled in that way, but it turns out to be uh, very useful, as I'll discuss in a minute. So for the bits, one could use photons for the bits or qubits, uh, and that's what we like to use. Other people use atoms or spins of electrons or superconductors, lots of different approaches. So why is a quantum computer more powerful than an ordinary computer? And sort of an intuitive explanation is shown here. Suppose I have some sort of a processor that performs a specific algorithm, whatever it might be, let's say searching for the factors of an integer or whatever. And into this algorithm comes n inputs, and coming out of it is n outputs. So if this were a classical processor, you could only send in one input at a time and get one output. But in quantum mechanics, we can send in a superposition state where we have an equal probability of a zero and a one up here, equal probability of a 0 and a 1 in here, and so on. And if you think about it a minute, what we're doing is we're sending in every possible input to this processor all at the same time. And then quantum mechanics is a 
So what comes out is every possible uh, solution to the inputs. Every possible output comes out of here. Now, if we stop the computer in the midst of this and ask, well, what are you doing? It would collapse into one particular calculation. But the key is to not stop the computer and look at interference between these outputs. And it can be shown that quantum interference between all these possibilities do give numerical results that classically would have required the computer to do every conceivable calculation all at once. So it's a massive parallel processing, what it really is. So roughly speaking, that's, that's how the quantum computer is more powerful than a regular computer. Um, <clears throat> our group was the first to demonstrate the logic operation using photons as the bits. And um, the most basic logic operation for a quantum computer is called a controlled not operation. Not just means reverse a bit or flip it from a zero to a one. <coughs> Excuse me. So this uh, operation has two input bits, a control bit and a target bit, and these are 0 and 1, or a superposition of 0 and 1. And the desired operation is this, that if the control bit has the value 1, we want to flip the value of the target bit. If the control bit is a 0, we don't do anything to the target. And that operation is sufficient to do addition and subtraction and multiplication and uh, build a computer. So the, the implementation we came up is up with is surprisingly simple. We have a pair of entangled photons that do not enter into the logical uh, calculation. They simply are used as a resource. One goes through here, one goes through here. We have uh, beam splitters that uh, the control and target photons come through. And then we detect what state the um, additional photons here are in. And it turns out that the collapse of the wave function that I mentioned, when you do this measurement, is sufficient to produce the logical output that we would like to have. And so this successfully uh, does do that logic operation. Uh, this is a picture of the experiment. It was done a number of years ago. And you can see it's a double deck optical bench with all sorts of mirrors and lenses and so forth down here and then a whole bunch up, up there. Um, that's about all we can put on one bench. Uh, we've now um, gone to optical fibers and replaced all of these free space paths with optical you'll see in a minute, so it's much more compact, and we can do a lot more that way. Uh, let's see, I have a bit of time to talk about research that we're currently doing, and um, some of this will be a bit technical, but uh, in the end, I'll some pictures of the experiment, so uh, you get some idea of what it is that we're doing. The goal of the experiment is to do non-local interference of the sorts that I just mentioned earlier, where we have one of these interferometers over here and another one maybe 100 miles away. <clears throat> and we want to do uh, send um, a Schrodinger cat this way and a Schrodinger cat that way, send them through the interferometers, and then produce quantum interference that violates the Bell's inequality and can be used for various applications. Um, so previously we did it with single photons. And now we want to do it with Schrodinger cats. And uh, so what is a Schrodinger cat? Well, how is that different from a photon? Well, the idea is that this is you know, a macroscopic system that you could see with your own eyes, not just a single photon. So that's the idea, and it is an ambitious experiment. <clears throat> uh, this is a collaboration between uh, our university, and this is my colleague Todd Pittman, uh, John Howell at the University of Rochester, and Sasha Sergienko at Boston University, and here are our uh, graduate students at UMBC. This is funded by DARPA. It does have some possible uses for uh, secure communications. So here's the idea once again, the Schrodinger cats um, being sent through these interferometers. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're not going to use actual cats because that would be inhumane and furthermore, very difficult. And I like cats besides that. So uh, what we're going to use instead for our Schrodinger cats are laser pulses that are powerful enough that you can see them with your bare eye. Okay, so that's our idea of macroscopic is laser pulses that you can see. And so that will be our Schrodinger cats. We want to create these in uh, <coughs> superposition states. And the superposition will be in terms of the phase of the laser beam. Once again, we can adjust the phase of a wave by retarding it or advancing it. And so we want to have two different phase possibilities and a superposition of those uh, for macroscopic laser pulses. And uh, so that, that's the goal. 
Now, we start to get a bit more technical at this point, so bear with me. Um, it won't last long. Um, all right, so what are we going to do? Well, first of all, we have two laser pulses, beam one and beam two, and the idea is to make anti-correlated phases. So the angle between the vertical axis here and this um, vector represents of the laser beam. So we want to have a state where this one has been shifted in phase in the positive direction, and the other one has been shifted negatively, or perhaps this one was shifted negatively and that one was shifted positively, and states where this exists simultaneously, both of these states, to exist simultaneously to be a Schrodinger cat. Uh, there are some possible advantages in doing this, uh, which I won't go into, but roughly speaking, laser pulses can travel through a fiber <coughs> uh, without being destroyed, basically. <coughs> so how are we going to make these entangled uh, phase states? And that's shown here, and it makes use of an optical effect known as a, the Kerr effect. In the Kerr effect, if one beam of light goes through a crystal, a nonlinear crystal, at the same time as a second beam of light, then that will shift the phase of the second beam of light. So one, one beam of light controls the phase of a second beam of light, and that's called the Kerr effect. Ordinarily, that's a very tiny effect. Uh, we have ways to make it bigger that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so to make the uh, Schrodinger cat state, what we'll do is take a single photon, put it through a beam splitter or half silvered mirror so it either goes this way or along that path. If it goes along this path, it goes through a Kerr uh, <coughs> medium that makes a phase shift on laser 1, whereas if it goes through this path, it makes a phase shift on laser 2. And so that we can make these anti-correlated phase shifts in the two laser beams. So that's the idea for that. <coughs> Now, here's a very busy slide that I probably shouldn't show tonight, but I'll show it anyway. Uh, if you look at this carefully, over here on the left, we have the two laser beams, and this curve effect and that curve effect make the anti-correlated phases. Uh, without going into any details, I'll just say that these then travel some large distance, where we have two more curve media far apart, and a single photon going this way or that way can once again make a phase shift on this beam and also on that one. Uh, we then measure the phase and only select events where uh, there was zero phase altogether. So if this was a positive phase shift, this is a negative phase shift, and vice versa uh, down here. So that's, that's the experiment, <coughs> and this can be shown to violate the Bell's inequality. So you can get some idea of how it might violate it. Uh, the state that we produce in this way is a superposition. Once again, these two possibilities exist simultaneously. And what this notation indicates, the um, first one indicates a laser beam that has been shifted positively in phase and then negatively. And the other laser beam was shifted negatively and then positively, or vice versa. And we can get quantum interference between these two terms. And that interference then uh, would violate the Bell's inequality and demonstrate that the Schrodinger cat states can, are, are non-classical and could not be described by uh, Einstein's hidden variable theories. So that's the idea. <clears throat> to make the phase shift bigger, what we do is we take the single photon and we put it between two mirrors that are very close together. We basically compress the photon into a small volume. Now a photon has a, a, a fixed energy and that corresponds to the electric and magnetic fields. So as you squeeze it together, the electric and magnetic fields have to become larger and so therefore it interacts more strongly with an atom. So the bottom line is that we can uh, get more stronger interaction that way. Also, the photons will bounce back and forth <coughs> thousands of times between these mirrors, so the photons interact for quite a while. <coughs> uh, we do this using a noble gas uh, known as xenon, and the reason is in previous experiments we used uh, an element called rubidium, which works great, but it's very reactive and quickly destroys the mirrors. So the idea is now we're going to use a noble gas to avoid that. Uh, now the noble gases in the ground state um, are not useful because the photons that will go up to the first excited state are in the ultraviolet and not useful. So what we do is shown here, and once again, for the benefit of any um, physicists in the audience, uh, xenon has a ground state here, the lowest energy state. And this is the so-called metastable state. If you put the atom into this state, it essentially stays there for a very, very long time. 
So this is like an effective ground state. And from there, we, if you absorb uh, the photon one, the control photon, uh, you can populate this level. And that level then applies a phase shift to the laser beam, which is, uh, interacts between these two levels. So that's roughly speaking how we generate the um, nonlinear phase shifts that we want. Here's a, a little drawing of the experiment or the main part of the experiment. We have uh, two mirrors that are held in very fixed uh, rigid orientation by a solid block of nickel. And uh, so the uh, photons come in through a glass window. They bounce around thousands of times between these mirrors and then they come out. Uh, we pump out all the air and put in a small amount of xenon and we have um, essentially microwave radiation coming in here from a coil that ionizes the gas just like in a fluorescent light bulb. So we create uh, xenon in this metastable state that interacts with the uh, photons. Uh, here are some pictures of the actual apparatus. Um, you know, sometimes people say that a picture is worth a thousand words, in which is case it's really worth 10,000 equations. So I think, I think the pictures are much better than any equations. Um, this shows a, a vacuum chamber, a relatively small one. Uh, you bolt it together and you can pump out all the air and put in a small amount of xenon gas in here. Uh, here are the, uh, the uh, metal block that holds the mirrors and the photons bounce around between there. Uh, we have to put this device into a shielded metal box because the uh, microwaves that ionize the gas will disturb our sensitive single photon detectors. So we have to put it in the box and shut the box to protect the experiment itself. Uh, I, I kind of like this picture for some reason. This shows the, uh, the microwave sources over in here. Uh, the the bluish-white uh, color is the xenon gas that's been ionized. Uh, the metal blocks are here and the mirrors are inside there. And so the photons are going to be bouncing around uh, between these two mirrors. And that allows one photon to control or make a phase shift in the other uh, laser beam. Uh, this is an early view of the experiment when it wasn't too complicated yet. Not terribly complicated. <laughs> it gets worse. Uh, here are our lasers. They are diode lasers, just like this laser pointer, uh, but they're very precise and can control the frequency to within about one part in a billion. So we have to control the frequency very uh, All these things that look like wires are actually optical fibers, and that's how we uh, carry light from one place to another. It's a, a glass fiber thinner than a human hair, and the light is guided down these fibers from one place to another. Uh, you may be able to see the uh, vacuum chamber here and uh, a vacuum pump over here. So one of the things we need to do for this experiment is to switch the laser beams from one path to another very quickly. So here's a stack of electronic switches, for example, that can uh, switch a laser beam from one path to, to another very quickly. And I think this is probably the last picture. This is the uh, experiment at a more recent date. <coughs> you can see there are more wires hanging down. There are more things on the table. And we're reaching the point where we can't fit anymore on this table. So uh, hopefully this is all we have to put into the experiment. So once again, uh, this is an experiment that we will use to generate Schrodinger cats and eventually entangled Schrodinger cats. And uh, they will be running around through these optical fibers, basically. All right, so uh, just one, one bit of experimental results. Uh, this is a nonlinear optical effect where um, one beam of light effectively changes another, and ordinarily that requires very powerful laser beams to produce such an effect. Uh, in this case, we're producing nonlinear effects using a control beam whose power is less than one nanowatt. That's less than a billionth of a watt. And once again, that's because it's confined to this small cavity. <clears throat> so what's plotted here is the uh, amount of power transmitted through the cavity as a function of the frequency. And then it's plotted for various different powers of the uh, control power. And you can see there is a difference even between powers of half a nanowatt and um, two nanowatts. So that's encouraging. It shows that one, we expect one photon will be able to produce uh, these kinds of effects. All right, so this brings us to the uh, summary. Um, entanglement does produce non-local effects. And uh, roughly speaking, any interpretation will require that information is being transmitted uh, faster than the speed of light. And before anybody asks about this in the uh, question 
session, let me say, that this does not allow you to send actual messages faster than the speed of light. And the reason is that these photons are deciding what to do when they are measured, but they decide on their own at random in some sense, and then the other one does exactly the same thing. Now, that's a useful process, but we can't control what they do, so we cannot send a message faster than the speed of light. So let me be, be clear about that. But nevertheless, something is happening classically faster than the speed of light. <clears throat> Einstein uh, referred to this as spooky action at a distance. He didn't believe it, didn't like it, um, but it turns out to be true experimentally. And uh, roughly speaking, this shows that quantum mechanics really is random and that these possibilities do exist at the same time. There's no, it's not as if they're determined in advance uh, and the randomness is possible. And finally, these effects may have practical applications and we hope that they will. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have some. So we do have a procedure for the questions. There are three microphones around the room. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. When you get the microphone, please stand up, say your name, tell us if you're a member of the society or you're not. There's no penalty. And then please ask your question. So the first question uh, here in the front row. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm a member. Um, I have a question about the geometry of the system. So you've got an 823 nanometer light that is essentially bouncing back and forth in a xenon-filled Fabry-Perot etalon. Exactly. And that 832 is your control. And then a second beam, is that going to propagate perpendicular so that you're introducing, so, so the 832 propagating along the axis of the etalon, is that introducing the phase shift in the other beam? And is the other beam perpendicular? Uh, that's correct. The uh, single photon is the control, and that's at 823 nanometers. And then the, um, the laser beam, the laser pulse, is at 853 nanometers. And actually, they co-propagate inside the cavity. They're bouncing around on top of each other. And then we separate the two with uh, gratings or filters or something like that. So it's not perpendicular. They it's, are it's not coaxial. Perpendicular. They're, they're on top of each other. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question over there. Right here? Right there. I'm a loud mouth. I don't need the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Richard Bardo, I just wanted to inquire what the frequency of a single photon was that you were considering. Uh, the frequencies, um, very, very high. So these wavelengths of 823 correspond, I believe, to roughly 10 to the 14th oscillations per second. On well, they're going to be big gamma ray, basically, frequencies, right? No, yeah. these are visible photons. Gamma okay. rays would be orders of magnitude even higher frequencies than this. Otherwise, you can't talk about single photons uh, if, if the wavelength is, lo is, is, uh, is wider than uh, the interatomic distance in solids. Uh, yeah, that may be. So we're not going through solids in any event. Uh, these are basically pulses from the laser. They're, they're about a nanosecond in duration, which means that um, light traveling along a na one nanosecond pulse is roughly one foot long. So envision these photons as one foot long as they go through. Then they go into the cavity and they bounce around for quite a while before they come out. Okay, so you, you know in fact that they are single photons then, huh? Oh yes, we have detectors that can measure that. And, okay. Uh, so we do know they'll be single photons. Okay. We have a... Kitty Monroe, I am not a member. Uh, I wanted to know please whether quantum mechanics or entanglement predicts that all matter, all photons, et cetera, has entanglement. Okay, no, entanglement is a rather special thing. And it's also very fragile. So prior to uh, 1965 or thereabouts, no one had ever created entanglement, to my knowledge, in the laboratory. So you have to work hard to get these kind of correlations. Um, well, it's become easier as technology develops. So it doesn't occur naturally. And furthermore, once you create an entangled pair of photons, if they interact with the environment in the wrong way, that destroys the entanglement, basically. They become uncorrelated as a result of random noise or something. So it is a kind of a fragile phenomena and doesn't occur naturally. Hmm? You have the mic? Yeah. Thank you. James Griffin. Uh, I, I have two questions. It's the same okay. question. Suppose that you set your <coughs> detectors so that they had a very narrow time window for acceptance. Uh, 
<laughs> in both cases, and then you considered time delays between them if that were possible. Question A, does the time-dependent quantum theory give you a prediction as to what will happen as the t uh, time shift gets larger or smaller? Question B, is there any experimental evidence about such a manipulation of the experiment? There is, and that's a very good question. Uh, if you take um, two photons traveling in two paths <clears throat> and you send them both through a beam splitter, there's a very non-classical non effect that occurs in which they tend to always come out together, whereas classically they would sometimes come out in different paths. In order for that to occur, the two photons have to lie on top of each other to within, well, in time, they have to be coincident to within about a femtosecond, uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So in fact, by varying the path lengths, which people and we do, uh, you can measure time delays as small as 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And, and to, my, to my knowledge, that's the most accurate time delay measurement technique that there is. How does it depend on the frequency of the photon? Well, it doesn't depend on the frequency. What we're, ta what we're talking about is delaying one photon compared to the other. Um, and, and they would have the same frequency in that case. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, we, we generate states where photons come out, and we don't know when they were emitted. So we don't know where this photon is or where that one is. Right. And then we do have very fast detectors. We measure when this photon arrives, and that immediately determines when this one will be detected. So there is a strong correlation in the um, times, and we do make very quick uh, measurements. Now, regarding the uh, phase velocity, uh, that can be infinite, but uh, information is not transmitted at that speed. It's at the, the group velocity. So, so basically, the, when the photons move along physically, that's the group velocity, which is not more than the speed of light. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. It might be, might be better. Just uh, let the gentleman go first. John Greenhill. There's some been recent work about slowing light down in the metasec, and they've slowed light down, and they've stopped it. Yes. The photon has been stopped, and then it can regenerate. Can you see any interesting uh, developments with these very, when you put two photons going very, very slowly, like in, you know, one, you know, they say you can almost stop the photon, right. and then could the, the interference effects be very dramatic? Yes, they could. That's a very good observation, and there are groups who deliberately take the photons, as you say, they slow them down in some medium, so they're on top of each other for a long time, and then they get a large interaction. And that's roughly equivalent to what we do, where they travel at the speed of light and they just bounce around on top of each other for thousands of times. So yes, that, that technique is used. My name is Rudy Krutar. I am a member of the society. <coughs> uh, I once told a friend that I knew what kind of cat Schrodinger had. And she had actually visited Schrodinger in his, house, in his home. And, and I told her it was a tabby because of the interfer interference patterns on its <laughs> and she said I was right. <laughs> okay, I guess that's right. <laughs> I agree. Tabby. tabby cats are best. And, and when the, we do uh, our Schrodinger cat experiment, we will but, procure tabby cats. <laughs> yeah, the, the technical point is that it is possible to have three particles exist in an entangled state such that there's no correlation between any two of them, but if you measure two of them, then the third is determined. Yes, that's true. There's also entanglement between three particles and, in principle, more. Yes, and experiments and, have been done. And that I, way. I keep hearing people talk about highly entangled and maximally entangled, and, and that's not what entangled means. If you have a question, could you keep your hand up a little longer so we can get the microphone to you? So we have one right in the front here, and then we have one in the second row, all the way on the right, and then we have one in the back, about three rows forward, and then we have another person in the back on the right over there. So Lots please. of questions. That's always a good sign. My name is Steve Coleman. I'm a visitor from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. In my free time, I work on my own unification theory. So I have a question slightly off topic from the conversation here. 
But my question is, how many ways do you know of to create a pair of entangled particles without a photon being involved? With no photons. Uh, Other than a Bose-Einstein condensate. <coughs> Well, they're superconducting uh, devices that can do yep, that. Yeah, electromagnetism. And there are involved. electron spins that don't really uh, involve, um, well, they involve Coulomb field and so on. So I think the electromagnetic interaction comes in in all of these, basically. That's, right. what, I, that's what I was leading mm -hmm. to. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this fellow right here in the second row. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Jim Fraser. I'm a visitor. Um, Einstein's objection was both to um, both to non-local effects, the the action at a distance, uh, and also to the non-realism or indeterminacy, you know, playing dice mm -hmm. with the universe. Right. Uh, it's it's possible, at least theoretically, to have a a non-local deterministic or realistic theory. And uh, I I. Uh, I'm not a scientist, you know, from what I know from Wikipedia, uh, Bohmian mechanics or something like that had a, had, had a theory that, or, uh, or has a theory that is non-local but retains determinism and therefore our more intuitive sense of realism. Mm -hmm. uh, when I've mentioned this to, to physicists um, or, or people who, who know more about this than I do, they say, oh, that was disproved. That's been disproven too. Uh, and I wonder, um, if, if, if that's the case, if you could sort of explain how non-local uh, determinism has been disproven. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not been disproved. So basically what Bell's inequality and these experiments show is we have to give up either realism or locality. And uh, some physicists will give up one, some will give up the other. But to my knowledge, there's been no experiments that actually rule out what you just said, deterministic theories which involve real you know, real forces that act instantly from one place to another. So most, most physicists find that not very uh, agreeable, uh, the idea that there could be real forces that are faster than the speed of light, in which case you should be able to send information and so on, and it, and it, and it totally disagrees with relativity theory. I don't think it's been experimentally ruled out, but most physicists don't like that idea very much. The gentleman is standing up, and please keep your hand up so we can get the microphone to you. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm uh, not a member. Uh, so a couple questions from a non-expert. I was just wondering, uh, how, do you, how do you produce single photons or pairs of photons? Um, how, like, what are the different methods for entangling any particles? You kind of addressed it, but I don't, uh, not in a non-technical way. I'm just wondering. And then also, uh, you kept referring to uh, violating classical understandings by traveling at the faster than the speed of light. Are there quantum understandings that explain how the information is transferred? Okay, that's two very good questions. The first is, uh, I did not explain how we created any of these entangled states. Uh, the best way is to take a, a powerful laser beam and send it through a nonlinear crystal. And some of these crystals have the ability to take a single photon in the laser beam and literally split it into two photons that come out at a slight angle compared to each other. So that, those photons that come out are entangled. And the best way to make a single photon is to take one of those sources of two photons. And then when I detect one photon in this path, I know that there's one and only one photon in the other path. So that's our best source of single photons and, and some idea of how we create the um, entanglement with nonlinear crystals. Now, remind me of the second question again, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned that there were, they violated classical understanding <coughs> to suggest that information transferred faster than the speed of light, but um, you didn't speak to any maybe quantum understanding. OK, the quantum understanding. Um, <coughs> I have a somewhat uh, non-standard view of this which is that there is no deeper understanding of this. I thought about it for many, many years. Um, you know, you can get into philosophy or this and that. Uh, basically, these effects occur. They seem strange, but this is the way nature is. And at some point, there are just certain assumptions. You know, the laws of physics are certain assumptions, and these are what the assumptions are. So I personally have given up on trying to find a deeper understanding to what it really means. Um, maybe I shouldn't do that, but uh, the alternative is you could go to meetings, say, 20 years ago, and there would be people who would debate what I thought were philosophical issues for hours and make no progress at all. So, 
So uh, some people are nodding their heads, and I think this agrees with a statement by Richard Feynman, who uh, once said, uh, forget the interpretation, just calculate, right? Um, I, I, I took quantum mechanics from Richard Feynman, and I agree with that approach. The young lady there in front of the previous questioner, please. Yes, you. Yeah, I have a question about one of your diagrams. I think it was where you had layers of interference and a, and a particle. Um, does, a, does the hologram come into play at any point there? And does it have any Well, uh, a hologram is one type of wave um, phenomena. And so in principle, we could create holograms using particles instead of uh, laser beams. Uh, to my knowledge, no one's done that. Maybe I just haven't seen it. But, but you're right, holograms are a form of wave uh, phenomena. Um, they could be used to demonstrate these kinds of things, but it's a bit difficult uh, using particles. So I don't think it's been done to date, but it is related. Yeah. We'll do two more questions. If, <clears throat> if Pierre will give William the mic, he can ask a question. Thank you. Hi, well, I, my name is William Reinhardt. I'm a guest. Uh, this isn't a question, it's two comments. I only expected to make one, and well, that's we about only do questions. Bohmian quantum mechanics. First of all, that was N. David Merman who made the comment, don't think, just calculate. Uh, mm. But there's debate about that. Oh, well, we can debate that. Yeah. Uh, the question is, you know, is there more than just the millions of states in a possible quantum superposition? And it turns out that people doing molecular reactivity in chemistry have taken those superpositions of millions of quantum states, created the Bohmian potentials, and then run classical trajectories, and then they can see that that classical dynamics gives them a deeper understanding of actually what the chemistry is. So that's sort of <coughs> backing classical dynamics out of the quantum dynamics to learn something that you can talk about, whereas a superposition of a million states, maybe you can understand it, but most people can't. Now that, that's a good comment. Um, a lot of times it's good to look at the classical limit of quantum mechanics to understand exactly what, what is going on, and I agree. Last question, there's a hand up right behind you. Pierre, right back there. I'm Terry Layton, I'm a member. Is there a next big question that you'd like to see answered? <laughs> I can think of a lot of questions I'd like to see uh, answered. Uh, I'll mention two. Uh, one is this entanglement is something that happens over a distance. And according to quantum mechanics, it doesn't matter how far the distance is. But one could ask, what happens if it's uh, a million miles apart? And does it somehow degrade eventually? And there are some theories as to how um, gravitational effects, for example, might cause a degradation in these effects. And so, in principle, it would be good to do these experiments, or at least theories, over larger and larger distances to see if it somehow does eventually break down. So that's, that's one question I'd like to see the answer to. And the other thing that I'm currently interested in is quantum mechanics and curved space time, sort of the interaction of um, quantum mechanics and gravity. So that's another big question area. Well, thank you very much. And before you Thanks go, you. Thank you all. Thank you all. So before you go, in appreciation for coming down here and uh, giving this wonderful lecture, we're going to present you with this signed copy of the announcement of your talk All right. Um, from the General Committee and the members of the Society. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'll do your computer later. Okay. I also want to compliment the audience on their attentiveness and, and, and technically um, astute questions. <laughs>